So I was just saying there that in Isaiah 61, what we just read there, uh, and we look at Isaiah, uh, Luke 4 verse 18, it's a similar passage, it was a prophecy sent several hundred years before. Um, I'm not a theologian, so I can't give you the exact years, I wonder if our brother Seth knows, but how many years before, but it would have been about several hundred years before. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I just want to say that in these two scriptures, I want to say there's two days, not today, there's two days we're talking about here. There's one several hundred years ago, and then the day that Jesus fulfilled that very prophecy. He fulfilled it by reading it out and, and saying, today you've heard it. Listen, I want to talk about the power of God today. I want to talk about his anointing on you. I often have people pray for me saying, anoint Graham. And forgive me for being blunt with them, I say, don't pray to be anointing me, I'm already anointed. Amen. I want you to pray for more anointing, I'm happy with that. But don't pray that I'm anointed because every single morning of my life, I pray for his glory to be revealed in my life. So today's talk is called Just Looking. And there's two days, as I said. And there's two types of things I want to chat about just to start off and set the scene. Um, when you walk into a shop, I don't know whether you've done this lately, and straight away you get somebody come along and say, um, are you, can I help you? Can I help you? And they'll either say, you can either say to them, I'm just looking, or yes you can, can I get one of them? And I don't know about you guys, but the minute someone comes up to me and says, can I help you? What you I get a little bit like, oh no, I'm all right. I'm just looking. Well, why have I gone in the shop? Why am I in there? There must be a reason I'm in there and someone wants to help us. So our ways often Oh, get out my face. I'm just looking. I'm just looking. We should take what's on offer. We should take the assistance. We should be humble and ask for help. You know, people come here all the time. And we, I come here for you guys. I'm not, I'm not here for me today. Even though I love being here and I, I love it. I come to serve you guys. This building is a place to serve you guys so we want to help we want to serve we want to make sure everyone's okay and um and that's what we we're here for but the reason we go into a shop we might be just looking but why not take the assistance help why not drop it our attitude the way we are and ask for help so I don't know whether you've ever done that lately, walked in the shop and never listened or got a bit attitude, but you never know what can even happen from that from that small bit of chatting with that assistant. Jesus knew exactly what he was saying when he read out that scroll. When he read out from that scroll, he knew all about the power of God. Last night, 
I was speaking at our Alpha course in uh, Middlesbrough and it was the first talk on the Holy Spirit and I spoke about Jesus being here before he came what do I mean by that? well this universe was created through the eyes of Jesus in Hebrews 1 verse 2 the Spirit of God has always been here the power of God has always been here if you read Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 before anything was formed before God had spoke anything into existence the Spirit of God hovered the earth Jesus knew exactly what he was saying he knew and understood the power that he was talking about the power that I want to talk to you about I um, was talking to Chris and some others the other day and um, every week every single week of my life as a Christian especially when I've come into really full time ministry um, probably dating back 1997 I've always asked the Lord every Monday uh, when I get up on the morning Lord what is the theme of the week what is it you want me to be looking at and concentrating on for this week and um, anyway I, I, I woke up on Monday morning I've been getting up very very early I was up at 4 o'clock Monday morning and I went downstairs did my usual thing put the kettle on made myself a pint of tea and went in the room and did my business with the Lord and he gave me Luke 4 verse 18 and Isaiah 61 which we just read about the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news and he said to me I want you to speak about that on Friday and that's what I want you to talk about during the week he also told me um, about Matthew 14 verse 22 which no doubt you've heard me talk about about when Peter gets out the boat and stuff like that and anyway when I'd finished my, what I was doing with the Lord I put the TV on and I really I taped one session on the Bible that was on the telly I'd only got one I'd only taped one and I put and I felt I should put it on when I when I pressed the, the sky thing to come up on the Bible on the oh, when I pressed it it was on 33 so someone has already watched it up to 33 minutes and I really thought that was something significant John 3 verse 3 unless you're born again you won't even see the kingdom of heaven so I thought that 33 3, 3 was very significant and when I pressed play Peter was just stepping out of the boat I was like electric was running through me it was absolutely amazing that feeling that I was sitting in my front room and God speaking to me over and over again because I tell you the truth the feeling that you get when you know God's speaking to you and you're in his will never ever changes what a privilege that I'm sat in my room and God speaks to me I've just walked in there and then I, remember I went to the prayer ritual on Sunday night that's what the, this is the verse that the Lord gave me and I spoke it out about the spirit of the sovereign Lord of the awesome brilliant that probably mm -hmm. it is amazing how God speaks to you but the amazing thing is is that it was the power the power of Jesus telling Peter to walk on water now we shouldn't take that lightly and we should believe that we can do that we should believe that we could raise the dead we should believe it we should believe it we should believe that we can pray for people to get the blind the blind see again we should hit pray that deaf people can hear again we should believe that the lame can walk and not take it lightly we should, should believe this we should be well within our grasp to believe it and to keep believing it listen we aren't a cult we're just free people walking with Jesus who carry a lot of power but most of all 
we should believe that our sins can be forgiven. We should believe that most of all, apart from any of that healing, why Jesus came to the planet. And it was to forgive sins, to reconcile man back to God. In Acts 10 verse 38, it says this, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. That's you and me. Let me tell you something. When I was in prison um, in 2003, I met a lad called Bambi, Jason Bainbridge. He's well off the track now, he's nowhere walking with the Lord or anything like that. But when, I'm, when we met him, um, sorry it wasn't then, it was 1999. 1999 it was when I met Bambi. His name was Jason Bainbridge. And in the chapel, something happened to him. The Spirit of God came upon him and his life started to change. And by Christmas of, of, of 1999, people were talking about Bambi. Now, why would they be talking about him? Well, let me tell you a little bit of history of him. He stabbed people, he took heroin, he smoked crack cocaine, and he attacked prison officers. He was a really, really nasty lad. And he'd been brought up in Glasgow and went from Glasgow to live in Bishop Auckland. His dad ran some bouncers in Bishop in, uh, in Glasgow. And his dad was meant to be a hard man as well. But he had a daughter who was 12. And he'd never seen her since she was five. And he really wanted to see her. He really wanted to have contact with his daughter. And so he pr I said to him, pray about it, Jason. Just pray about it. He said, I believe, I'm going to believe, I'm going to pray, I'm going to believe. He got a letter off his dad, which he said was very, very unusual. And in the letter, it said, Stephanie wants to get in touch with you. Hang on a minute, he hasn't seen her since he was five. This is seven years later. Do you think that's a coincidence? Or do you think that is a God incident? Because I said to him, what do you think, Jason? He said, I believe God is in it. He rang her. He had a conversation with her. She came to see him. This lad was totally changed. The power of God changed him. Not me. Well, not me. It's not me. It was the power of the Holy Spirit, which I believe I'm filled with. And I believe that you can be filled with it every day and a, and a call to do the same thing. Listen, Jason Bainbridge, stop drinking. Well, in a minute, uh, Anne. Uh, is it important? No, I just want to say something about what I've done that changed my life. Yeah. Because I was drinking and I was doing all the wrong things. Yeah. And then I started drinking and I started doing the wrong things. And said, yeah. I prayed for them and immediately they felt better and got us all to bed and started waiting dancing around. Amazing. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thanks for that, Anne. Well, it's amazing, see, the power of God. The power of God that's upon us. Now, oh, listen, you have nothing to fear when you're walking with the Lord. Because it says in the scriptures that when you open your mouth, he'll fill it, he'll give you things to talk about, and he'll help you. Some people say, well, that's not my calling, but you're called to be a servant of Christ. You're called to serve Christ. And whatever you do, and however you do it, we are called to be his servants. Now, a servant, you think of a servant who has to do this and has to do that. But well, Jesus doesn't call you a servant no more, he calls you a friend. It's biblical, he talks to you as a friend. I want to serve him. I don't have to, I want to. You ask Natasha how my day goes, I don't have, I don't have a day off. I don't have a minute off. My ministry is 24-7. I'm at the football, 
I'm in the shops, I'm on the streets, I'm in London, wherever I am, whether it's Christmas, Easter, Portugal, I'm looking, I'm looking to tell people about Christ. Tell them beggars in Portugal with no legs. Tell them my mum, praying for my mum who didn't know she had cancer. She gets healed. I know she got healed of cancer or in that place in Portugal. Why? Because I'm constantly walking and wanting to serve Jesus. Why? I want to. That's my desire. Listen, if you don't feel called to go and preach, if you don't feel called to go and do something, you need to be here helping us. You need to come here during the day and come and help us. Come and get involved, come and volunteer. Come and serve the Lord in here. Go away, come back, renew and serve us. Serve the Lord with us, like we do every day. We claim every day that the anointing of God would flow from us. I'm already anointed as I said, but I need to pray every day that that anointing of God flows through me. I'm his vessel, it flows through Graham into other people. I, I waited, as you know, ten years to write my autobiography. Ten years I waited. Why? Why did I wait ten years? Because I didn't want two years of walking with the Lord to come through me. I needed them lads in the prison and people who probably couldn't believe someone could change or for someone who wanted to set up a ministry, I needed them to know that I was the real McCoy. I needed them to see a foundation built on the rock. Not a foundation that's built up on, oh, I'll, I'll write a book in a couple of years and I'll make money from it and I'll take drugs again and go back to jail or die which I've seen many times before the book even went to print the lad's back on the gear or he's died or he's come out and he's dead now or he's back on drugs how much of a watered down piece of evidence is that for Jesus that one minute someone's writing a book or preaching on the street corners the next minute they're sat in a pub or they're sat in jail now yes we all make mistakes we all fall, we can all go here, or we can all do that. I'm on about massively, massively this happening. Not small, I'm on about big, big falls. Listen, if you were ever going to preach the gospel, if you were going to do that in a big way, you need a foundation for when that attack comes, when that temptation comes. Because I tell you what, you stick your head up above the parapet, you're going to get shot at. My mate always says, when we were young, even the best fighter planes get shot down. Even the best fighter planes get shot down. It doesn't matter how much of an expert, or you know the scriptures, the devil's always after you. It's all to do with your relationship with Jesus, that'll keep you sustained in the attack. So I waited ten years. I had people coming up to me everywhere I went speaking. First year, second year, third year, fourth year, fifth year, sixth year, seven years, eight years, nine years down the line. People coming up to me saying, why don't you let me write your story? Why don't you do this? It was very tempting. It was very tempting to write a book when I was three years a Christian and write a book and pass it about, I've got a book. I wasn't ready. And I got this advice from Patrick that I should keep it in my heart and not in my head because it's nothing to do with me and that book was wrought under the influence of the Holy Spirit and that is why thousands and thousands and thousands of people in the jails in the United Kingdom have read it and been affected by it they reckon that Holy Trinity Brompton uh, CWR reckon at least 200,000 people I've read that book in the jails. It's in 2,000 libraries, two books in the United Kingdom. They reckon it's been public, been let out at least 30,000 times. It's having an effect everywhere. Why? Because the Holy Spirit of the power of God is involved, not me. 
Yes, it's my story, but the foundation behind it is the power of God. And it's that power that we need. We need it. We need it every every day. And we need to believe we can have it. And we need to exercise our gifts. Upstairs is a gym. There's people up there training now. That's what you can hear, the music up there. Giving them motivation to get going. We're going to get them some nice Christian stuff. Motivation Christian music. But if they went up there and just looked around. Well, this is a nice gym. And didn't do any training. It wouldn't be a gym, would it? It would just be a room, wouldn't it? Would it just be a room? It might as well be down here. Oh, this is a gym. No one trains, no one exercises, no one does any fitness stuff. Oh, my mate who has a garage, Chris Andrews, who has his car garage, who helps me out with my car. If you go to his garage and there's no cars and there's no fixing of cars, it's just a room. But you, when you get there, there's cars, there's people fixing cars, there's people valeting cars. They're exercising what they're meant to be doing. Listen, are you called to be a, a disciple of Christ? Have you put your hand up? Have you asked Jesus into your life and said, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of all? If you have, you need to be exercising what he's given you. And that's that power. You know, the... the, the the phrase that we used to shout about in 2000 when Spider-Man come out. We went to see Spider-Man in Oxford. We were doing a mission in, in Abingdon. And Spider-Man, that, that phrase that's probably gone all around the world. When Peter Parker's talking to Uncle Ben in the car. And Uncle Ben says this, with great power comes great responsibility. Listen, we have great power on us. And we have responsibility to exercise that power. Why? Because God's given us it. Jesus died on a cross so that he could go to his dad and say, you know what? They, they need something inside them to give them that power to say no, to stop drinking, to stop taking drugs, to stop pornography, to stop gambling, to stop being greedy, to stop being depressed, to stop being anxious. Stop being deaf, stop being blind, stop being lame, stop being dead. But they need that power in them. So Father, will you send them it? But he's not going to send it unless you're asking for it. You can come and look around Chris's garage all you want. But unless you ask him for a drive of the car that you might want to buy, you don't even, you're not even going to get a look in. He doesn't know what you want. Until you ask him, you must ask. You must go and ask. You have the power. Have you ever seen the Matrix? The film, the Matrix. Yeah. I don't know what you think of the Matrix. I liked it. I liked them. Number two, I liked the most. But it was only when um, now I forgot his name now, haven't I? Neo. Neo. It's only when he. See you. What's there? It's only when he believes. Is that right? It's only when he believes. That he's got the power that he can do what he does. And they said, Oh, he's a chosen one. Listen, let me tell you something. Our champion, our King of Kings and Lord of Lords, when he read this scroll out, he knew exactly what was going on. He knew exactly who was reading this. He knew exactly what was about to happen. Do you know what happened? Do you know what happened? He went through out them towns doing what it said, what Isaiah prophesied. He's here, the Messiah, the chosen one, the anointed one, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he's walking through the towns doing what it says he's doing, setting people free, giving the uh, uh, people who can't see the sight. Deaf people can hear. He raised the dead, he stopped the funeral. And told them to get out of the coffin. He called Lazarus out. He stopped the woman bleeding. He walked on water. He had the power. He knew when he read that scroll that today it's been fulfilled in your hearing. It was today. And you know what? It's not changed. It hasn't changed since he said them words. It's not changed. It's here now. 
If you want it, you can have it. It's up to you. It's your choice. But the sad truth is, I want to get a bit negative. The sad truth is, though, is the majority of the body of Christ, the church, are living very weak lives, the very inferior lives, and anemic lives, and they're always looking for someone to bless them, to encourage them, to lift them up, to prophesy them on them. In other words, the majority of the body live their lives looking at the word and not using the word. I'm, I'm sorry to say, but a lot of the church don't believe in the power of God. Because you know what, just like I said last night to the lads, Chris was with me, Chris Carter was there with us last night, just like I said to you guys here, man has got in the way, man's in the way of it, and he wants the glory, that's why the emphasis is on the Father and Son, oh we mentioned the Holy Ghost, he's not a ghost, he's a he. The Spirit of God is a He. It's part of the Godhead, part of the Trinity. The power that drives out whatever you want it to drive out. And you should believe it. But the majority of people who go to church on a Sunday believe, and I'm going to say this, I don't care what anyone thinks. And I've been saying it ever since I was a young Christian. I believe that the devil gets people up on a Sunday morning to go to church. Yeah. I do. Yeah. I believe it. Right. Because when they go to church on a Sunday morning, they believe they're free. Six and a half days of the week, they'll do whatever they want to do. Yeah. They'll do all kinds of sin. All kind But you know what? Sunday morning will come, put on the Sunday best, and go and get forgiven by a man. Listen, we aren't churchianity in here. It's Christianity. We're born of God. It's a duty every day to ask Jesus to come and be with us every single day of our lives. People say to me, you don't go to church on a Sunday morning, Graham. You are, you do Yeah, I go to football on a Sunday morning. Take my son to football. But I'm ministering to loads of people. Because that's my job. I'm a minister. I minister the gospel of Christ. And then I had a good look at myself and I thought, no, I'm not a minister. I'm not a minister, I'm an administrator. Because I go and administer the gospel to someone and I hope they go and minister it to someone else. I, I believe I'm, I'm like an administrator of the, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news that sets people like me, who lived on a bench for three years, who was in a coma, who people wrote off, who my mum was told to turn the machine off, and then Christ woke me up to do what I do now. That is the power of God, to wake a dead man up, who was totally addicted, who was totally selfish, this violent criminal, for years and years and years, who was a result of um, all them things that he got involved with. The rejection, the pain, the sorrow that he felt for himself, getting the violin out every day. He was woke up out of this coma. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Anybody, not, not me, not, not pastor, anybody who is in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. I woke up out of that coma, a new creation. I didn't know it then. I didn't know it, but the power of God woke me up out of that coma through prayer. You should believe every day that you can raise people from the coma through the power of God. That you can pray for someone and something will happen. You need to believe it, you need to keep believing it. If not, you'll just be anemic, you live an anemic life. You'll be looking for someone to encourage you, someone to tell you, oh, you talk good. I don't care what you think of my talks. I don't care what anyone thinks of me, as long as I tell you the truth. Honestly, I don't. 
I'll be openly admit that I'm not a good preacher. But you put me in a prison on the street with someone who doesn't know Jesus and I can do my job. I'm an evangelist, stroke pastor. I want to see people come to know Jesus because that's what happened to me. We're going to move on to a bit of good news. But I have come that you may have life to the max. John 10.10 10. I have come that you may have life abundant to the max. Live life to the max. But we see just before that Jesus was saying, but there is a thief. There's a thief. And he wants to steal, kill and destroy. Patrick used to say to me, do you know Satan's a murderer? The devil's a murderer. He wants to murder your spirit. Let's have a look how that began. Let's have a look if he does murder people's spirits. You've got Adam and Eve walking in the garden, living life to the max, naked, don't notice each other's nakedness. Why? Because they're living in harmony with God. Life's great. God's walking in the garden with Adam on a night and amazing life. He had everything. And then he gets tempted. Tempted. She gives him that fruit after she's been talked to by the serpent. Let me tell you something, that serpent wasn't on its belly. It was looking in her eyes, stood up. That snake. Ah, oh, you sure God said that? You know the problem is, she didn't even hear of God. It was Adam who heard. Adam heard from God, not Eve. So Eve doesn't really understand what's going on. Because she hasn't been spoken to by God. That's why no one can really tell you that God isn't speaking to you. That's why so cheaply people have come to me and said, but I think it's God telling me, Graham, I can't go against it. I know it's wrong. I know that they're making a mistake, but so cheaply they try to get one over on me. Listen, I'm not being funny. You've got to get up very early in the morning to catch me out. All these contracts, I wrote the book. I wrote the book with all these cons, didn't I, Paula? Paula knows me from the street. I've survived on that street. I know every trick there is in the book. But I listen to Jesus. And I listen to him for you guys. And I have an understanding in my heart. If one of the people who come here are making a mistake. But so cheaply people have come to me in the past and said... But God's telling me, I can't deny that, I can't say to you, that isn't God. Because you might have heard from God, but like Eve, she hadn't even heard of God. She heard of Adam. And I promise you this, that you'll think it's God, and it's been a preacher. You might have even heard of me and thought, oh, that, that must be God, it isn't. You've got to hear God yourself. Eve didn't even hear God speak. It was... Adam who told her what they couldn't eat from. They can't eat the fruit. And as soon as they did, flesh was alive. It tells you that as soon as they did that, they noticed each other's nakedness. God said to Adam, where are you? He hid behind the bush. Where are you, Adam? He knew where he was. He knew exactly where he was. He knows where you are. He knows where I am. He knows when I'm doing sin knows when I'm hiding knows when you're hiding from God he knows it he wants to know where you are he wants you to come to him and say you know what Lord I'm sorry I need you to come back into my life I need you to help me I need you to come and drive me through this problem I will need that I need that power again and even Adam didn't do that and they went off he told them that you're gone. Do you know what? The minute he ate from that tree, that fruit, the spirit was murdered. Cut off. <coughs> Snapped in half. Murdered. Because the thief wants to destroy your spirit. Wants to kill your spirit off. I'm going to read John 14 verse 12 to 14. 
Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will be even great they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father and I will do whatever he, you ask in my name, so, so the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask for me what, for anything in my name, and I will do it. Listen, I want to ask you this today. I'm gonna, well, I'm telling you this. Stop being a patient and become a doctor. We walk through life, if we're not careful, just being a patient. Just being a patient, needing help from every single person, telling us, oh, you talk was good, Grandma, are you, bah, you're looking good today, Grandma, Grandma, are you okay, how are you doing, Grandma? I heard you were over there, Grandma, I heard you were doing good. I don't need that. I don't want that. I, I'm on fire for Jesus. If he tells me I'm alright, I'm fine. I don't want to be the patient. I don't need anybody to tell me this, that and the other or Do you know what? In the name of Jesus, as long as he tells me, as long as he's happy with me, great. Now let me tell you something. I'm not saying that you can't come and get help. That's different. I'm on about not going to the, to the Lord for it. Go to the Lord and ask him to help you and start exercising that faith. Start becoming a doctor. Start praying for people. We need Jesus. We need each other. Listen, if you did something and didn't ask for my help, I'd be really upset because I want to help you. I want to be here for you. That's why I'm here. So I'm not saying don't do that. What I'm saying is this. Get exercising your faith. Get becoming a doctor. Ask, praying for people. Telling them about Jesus. Instead of always needing it yourself. Because I'm here for you. You know that. The is here for you. Whenever you need us, we're here. And I would never say, oh, I'm sick of you chatting to me. Or I'm sick of trying to help you. Because I wouldn't do that. But what I want you to do is say, listen, do you know what? I'm, I'm going to go out and I'm going to preach the gospel. I haven't asked you if I could say this, but you know, Jam. <laughs> Jam says, they're all quiet. Doesn't do now. Comes in and she's an evangelist. Aren't you? Jam sits there very quiet. But you know what? If she gets the chance, she'll go and tell someone about Jesus. Won't you? And that's how we, and so other people in here do it. I know you, uh, I'm not saying you don't, I'm saying there is people in here who do that. Listen, get stuck on that rock and start exercising that power, the power that's in you. And it's not me, it's not anyone, but you can get it, you can tap into it every day. Don't be a patient all your life. Jesus will help you become a doctor. Like in Acts 3 verse 1 to 10. I want to read this to you. Acts 3 1 to 10. We're going to finish just now. Be about another hour. Yeah. Acts 3 verse 1 to 10. <laughs> One day Peter and John were going to the temple of the t at the time of prayer. At 3 in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. Take him, take him with him. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking 
and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognised him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were all filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened. I wanted to read that to you because that's one of my favourite scriptures. The beggar was an unfortunate man. This beggar is very unfortunate. He's been born lame. He's had to depend on everybody every day. I used to wonder to myself about this scripture. I used to think sometimes about it. I used to wonder whether the people who were taking him to the uh, to the gate. I used to think to myself, I wonder if they were conning him. I wonder if they maybe he's carried him. That he had to pay them, or he owed them rent, or there was something involved with it. You know, he had to be put there. Or were these his friends? Who knows? But whatever happened, he had to rely every day on somebody taking him there. He, he was desperately in need every day. He needed the help and generosity of others. But let me tell you something about him. He was a taker. He was a taker. Always in need. He was a taker. We come across people all the time who were takers. Always in need, always need someone. But I love this about Peter and John. This is what I love about them. They're seeing a future in this beggar. Did you hear that? They're seeing a future in this beggar. They didn't see the lame, taken beggar who was a poor, poor lad. Let's get him a bowl of soup. They seen the future in this this lad. They had faith. The future they could see was beyond what they could see with the naked eye. There's a lame lad who's been lame. You might know someone who's blind or deaf or has been ill all their lives. And you might think, ah, oh, you know, we'll help them, we've got to try and help them. But listen, you need to see a future. You need to have faith that there's a future, that the Lord can do something. Peter and John seen this lad and there was a future in him. They could see it. I was talking to you earlier about that power. The power that we should not take lightly of walking on the water. I was talking to you earlier about God speaking to me and then going and putting this video on and there, then the, there he is walking on the water. Listen, could you walk to Splash now and walk on the water? Do you believe you could? If you don't, you've got to believe it. Ah, oh, Grammy being daft? No, I'm not. I'm saying that you can walk on water if you've got to believe it. You've got to believe it. If not, you're full of fear. It mightn't happen, but you've got to believe it'll happen. Go and try it. I'll let you into a secret. I've tried it many times. My mum, bless her, she's got a swimming pool. She built for the boys. We're privileged to be able to go to my mum's in Portugal and my stepdad, he talks to me quite a lot now. And I've tried to walk across the water. I believe I can. I've never done it yet, but I believe I can. See, that's the difference. Do you understand what I'm saying? I haven't done it yet, but I believe I can. I believe it. I've got faith, which is the opposite of fear. I believe it and walk across that water. One day I'll let you know if I do. They saw Peter and John, when they seen this man, they seen that he would never have to beg again. I look in an addict's eyes, not just addicts, but unbelievers, 
and that's their future. When I've gone to see people, when I've met people, I don't see what they're involved with. I've had millions, not millions, sorry, hundreds of people ring me or meet me and say, oh, so-and-so's on drugs or on drink or can't get them to stop gambling. I can't. And I say, I'm not bothered about that. I'm not bothered about the drink and the drugs and the gambling and the cheating and whatever. I'm interested in what started it. When did it begin? Because I see a difference. I see a future in every single one of you. When I see you guys here, when I grab all the Sean by the arms and shake him like that, I haven't seen him for two weeks, I see a future in that lad. I see a miracle. When I seen Jazz for the first time, I see a miracle. I seen Barry when I met Barry and he first came in here. I see a man of God. I see a future. I don't see you. I see beyond you. Why? Because I'm a visionary. I have faith. When Elaine came back, I've known Elaine for 15 years. When Elaine came up here, I've seen a servant of Christ. When I've seen Paula, I know you, she won't mind me saying this. When I've seen Paula in 1997, I used to sit on the street with her. She'd be taking heroin and crack cocaine, didn't you? And I'd be drinking, taking drugs here and there. When I, when I was a born again Christian, when I was born of God, when I seen Paula, I never seen Paula. I didn't look at Paula and Stephen. I didn't look at them and say, oh, there's Paula and Stephen. I've seen a future. I've seen a miracle. I've seen disciples. You need to do it. You need to see what these, listen, these talks, these gospel readings in the scriptures aren't just for then, they're for now. We're privileged to be able to read them. You have an unsaved friend or loved one. You see beyond it. My son Caleb will tell you he's not a Christian. My oldest boy, he's not a, he said, I'm not a Christian dad. Last night at the Alpha, I'm sat with him. Alright, right, Lorraine, God bless. See you, see you next week. So, I'm sat in this church hall last night with my own, with Caleb and we went to the shop and we come back and we sat down there I didn't see my son I seen a chance I seen half an hour chance to tell him about his future I didn't talk to him about hockey I didn't talk to him about football I didn't talk to him about his mum I didn't talk to him about his behaviour guess what I spoke to him about? Jesus because I, if I try and befriend him and try and get round him, it's not going to help. Oh, he's some money, son. I love you, son. No. I sat telling him the truth of Christ and heaven and dying. I told him about my death. I told him about his mum dying. I told him about him dying. I told him about his children, how they're going to live. Why? I've seen the future. I've seen an opportunity and I seized it with both hands. He came out to me about for last night and he was sent by God, my son, to spend time with me. Listen, stop not believing that the people in your lives aren't going to get to know Jesus. Get them here. Believe they're going to come here. Believe they're going to come to our next charity night. Believe they're going to call somewhere where there's someone preaching the gospel. Why? Because see a future. Believe it. Have faith. Take it by the hands. By the by the just grab it and take it and believe it. Peter and John they believed it. Now let me tell you something. They had compassion, that same compassion that Jesus had, Matthew nine thirty six. Jesus said in Matthew nine thirty six, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. He said they were helpless and harassed like sheep without a shepherd. I want to just point out these next couple of things and then we can all share. Compassion is not pity. Let me say that again. Compassion is not pity. They are different. Pity 
may look and feel sorry, may even cry. If you have pity on someone, if I have pity on you, I may look at you and, I, and, and, and I've come, and, and like, have a bit of sympathy for you. And I might even cry for you. I might even give you some it. Oh, I've got pity on you. I haven't got that. Listen, I will never ever have pity for you. Ever. What I have got is compassion. Because you know what compassion does? I wrote this down. Acts of compassion changes the situation. I haven't got pity for you. I believe that Graham Seed and Natasha Seed's compassion for anybody who comes into our midst, we can change their situation. Because we have a God who can do anything he wants to do. He's not answerable to anyone. He can do anything. When these men... Peter and John were just men like us, or women, just like us, just walking through. My Peter and John weren't women, but Peter and John were walking. They had compassion. They knew that this lad would never beg again. They looked at him. They knew they had the power to change this man's situation. And in verse 6, which is a very, very important verse... The lad has asked them for something. And they turned around and he said, Silver and gold I have not got, but what I have got. What have you got? I want to ask you, when you see someone who isn't walking with Christ, what have you got to offer them? Jesus. Jesus, but what if you're not spending time with him? If you're not spending time with Jesus, how can you offer them Christ? If you aren't filled with power, how can you give them the power? You haven't got it yourself. This is why I'm saying it's very, very important to set your alarm clock, get up early and get the power for the day. It'll get you through the day. Get you through the day. Because once you can speak to someone's life, it isn't you affecting their lives. It's the power, the power of God. They knew what they had. Ah, I haven't got silver and gold, but what I have got, what I have got is Christ. We are walking around with the same spirit, let me be honest with you. You have the same spirit at hand as they had the supernatural working power of Jesus and the Holy Spirit let me give you a bit of a clue and a bit of advice one of the devil's greatest fears of you is that you recognise that you've got that power let me tell you that again one of the greatest fears of the devil is that you recognise that you have that same power. Seriously, that's the fear of his. Peter took the hand and pulled him out into a destiny out of his loneliness, help, hopelessness, brokenness, shameless life into wholeness, joy and fullness. I want to say to you today, Brothers and sisters, you need to start recognising that power. You need to recognise it, you need to believe it in your lives. You need to believe that you can be filled with that power. I want to pray for us. I really believe that we should pray. And um, I'm going to give you the chance to receive power. If you don't think you've got it, you can't, it's not just about getting it today and then leaving it, leaving it here and think, oh, that's enough for the week. You need to do this every day. You need to ask the Lord every day. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you so much, Lord, that when you died on the cross 
and you said it is finished you said it is completed paid in full sin can be no more if we want it to be we can be looked at by our Father in Heaven through the eyes of Jesus yes Lord we will continue to, to make mistakes and sin and but Lord we can be looked at by you Lord because of your great sacrifice on that cross for us that you paid for our sins in full and if we come to you Lord with all our hearts with all our minds with all our body with all our soul and we ask you Lord to be with us and forgive us and help us then Lord I know that our sins can be forgiven but it's a daily thing it's a daily event Lord and I pray right now Lord for my brothers and sisters and for people who are here for the first time Lord I pray now that you'd be with them that you'd help them that you'd, you'd let them hear the heart the first thing I want to ask is this